Hi, everyone. This is Doug Rex, ASG president. And it's a privilege today to be able to speak with my friend Yuri Ladebaum, who is professor of medicine at Stanford about um, colorectal cancer prevention, in particular, uh, prevention in this new group that we're screening, the 45 to 49-year-olds in uh, the U.S. Yuri is an is a internationally recognized expert in colorectal cancer screening and prevention. And in particular, he is an expert at modeling and modeling different strategies to uh, prevent colorectal cancer. So Yuri, you know, we, we have now a recommendation to um, screen 45 to 49 year olds for the first time from the US Preventive Services Task Force. The ACS has made this recommendation. Do we know actually that it's going to work in this group? Are they going to show up? Are they gonna get screened and will it work? Doug, first, I want to say thanks a lot for the invitation. This is very important and it's very near and dear to my heart. So I'm happy to share my thoughts. You ask a critical question, as most listeners will remember, when the ACS first came out with its recommendation, they said that it was largely based on the expectation that things would work as well as younger and younger as in older people. And for the USPSTF, a lot of the recommendation is based on epidemiology, rising cancer risk, but also models that essentially extrapolate both the natural history of, of polyps and cancer and also the test performance to the younger age group. And until recently, we didn't have a lot of data. The, the FOBT trials did include some younger subgroups, but there weren't many patients and those are not reported out as subgroups. And the FLEG6 studies didn't have younger people. So it's a very valid question. Is, is it gonna work the same way or, or equally in younger people? Now, we just published a study that I think is potentially important in this area. We looked at data from Florida for 45 to 49 year old people asking if you had a colonoscopy or if you didn't have a colonoscopy, what was your subsequent cancer risk? And we had a lot of people, about 200,000 who underwent colonoscopy, two and a half million more or less who did not have a colonoscopy and the adjusted hazards ratio for getting cancer later on was 0.5 for those who had a colonoscopy compared to those who didn't. So we think this is really important information. That's a substantial effect. Now, just for comparison, we also looked at the 50 to 54 year olds, people who we are screening now. And in them, comparable analysis, the adjusted hazards ratio was 0.32. Now, I wouldn't conclude that colonoscopy didn't work as well in younger people, because this is a time when we weren't doing average risk screening. There were more symptomatic people in that group. And also something we couldn't measure is how many of those people were really higher risk, like with family history. So it may be that the scoped 45 to 49 year olds were really higher risk than their comparators unscoped. And so I wouldn't say that colonoscopy performed differentially between the two. I was very happy to see at DDW this year that researchers from the nurses health study presented an abstract that had very similar results. Their, their multivariate hazards ratio was 0.39 for having colonoscopy under age 50 compared to not having it. Uh, th this, these were women in the nurses health study. And, and as many listeners may be aware, there are more and more studies coming out on what's the yield of colonoscopy for advanced neoplasia in the late 40s versus the early 50s. The numbers are not that different. There is an age effect. We know things go up with time but the numbers are not that different. So when we go back to the American Cancer Society, reasonable expectation that screening should work as well, I think it's a reasonable expectation. By the way, I don't think we're gonna have randomized trials in these groups. So we're probably left with observational data and extrapolation. And, and the last word I'll say is on biology. I, I think there may be a point in saying that very young onset colorectal cancer may include some cancers that are just different. Uh, faster progression, different biology, different responsiveness to treatment, treatment, maybe less screenable. But I think when you look at late 40s versus early 50s, there's no reason to think that you have some step function from screenable here and then not screenable just a few years before. They're probably pretty similar. So all in all, I think we're starting to build the evidence bases that, that fills in this question of expected benefit. There's probably nice observational data now that, that that's probably a true association. Okay, that sounds really good. Very good news uh, for this for this group that so far based on, on what we know, looks like 
colorectal cancer screening is gonna work, same kind of mechanisms by which cancer develops through polyps and so on, so that's good. Another thing that we look at when we think about screening is that we know that, that uh, healthcare is expensive. It's a, it's a huge problem, uh, the cost of healthcare in the United States and for, for many countries. And we also have different thresholds uh, that we measure the different types of care that we deliver. We want them to get a certain benefit for a certain amount of cost. And since we think there maybe are slightly fewer polyps, as you were saying, what do we know about doing screening in this group? Is it going to meet the standards for cost effectiveness? Yeah, hugely important question, Doug. And in the U.S., these types of studies in the past were mostly just discussion. You know, we may be at a point now where they, they are affecting policy. The modeling work that's done for the American Cancer Society and the USPSTF uh, doesn't take cost into account. So they were looking at outcomes and an indirect measure of the downsides, which is the number of colonoscopies. That's the way they quantitated. But shortly after the American Cancer Society recommendation came out, we set out to model this question, including cost. And we took into account the fact that colorectal cancer risk is increasing in the younger group. So when we looked at that and we published this in Gastro a few years ago, we estimated that moving down the screening initiation age from 50 to 45, if you're going to do screening colonoscopy, is actually quite cost effective. We estimated approximately $34,000 per additional quality adjusted life year gain. And for the US, that is well below a common threshold, which is on the order of about $100,000 per life year gain. Now, interestingly, in that study, we also updated our previous estimates of screening compared to no screening. And for the first time in our own hands, screening colonoscopy starting at 50 compared to no screening was actually cost saving. It's not often that interventions are cost saving. We're usually talking about how much does it cost you to get an increment of benefit, but, but actually being better than nothing and cheaper than nothing, that's, that's a home run. Now, why did that happen? I, I think it's because our inputs for the cost of cancer care continue to go up faster than the cost of screening. So if I had to summarize in, in our model, our latest estimates are that screening colonoscopy at 50 compared to no screening may actually be cost saving. And then moving it from starting 50 to 45 looks to be highly cost effective. So in that narrow question, yes, I think it's likely to be cost effective. Sounds great. So I think the public is increasingly aware that there are different ways to get screened. I think most people in the US have been screened by colonoscopy, but not everybody gets colonoscopy. We don't have adherence rates that are as high as we'd, we'd like them to. Um, we have other ways to, to screen, especially stool tests are available now. Um, what are your thoughts about the relative cost effectiveness of these different screening strategies, particularly in younger people? Yeah, so, so very good question. And when it comes down to modeling these questions that we're gonna extrapolate based on models, which I like because they basically synthesize all the information we have and then you make your best rigorous extrapolation as opposed to just, I think this is how it'll turn out. Then it all depends on the assumptions. So a, a couple of principles though, we talked about colonoscopy compared to nothing or compared to itself at, a, at an earlier age. When you compare it to the other options, then participation really matters. If you were to assume that participation is high and comparable across the board, and you don't need a program to achieve participation, then, then FIT is preferred. It's a very affordable test. If you assume that people do it all the time, the relative estimated effectiveness of FIT yearly or colonoscopy every 10 years, or FIT DNA, multi-target stool DNA every three years, all look very similar. Uh, colonoscopy and FIT may be a little better, but that's based on assumptions. You throw in cost and FIT really looks very good and FIT DNA looks expensive. But the reality is that we don't achieve that level of participation just in opportunistic care. The, the organized programs for FIT can be very successful, but those have their costs too. So when you throw that in, when you throw in the question of different behaviors over time, there are people who are good adheres over time, there are people who never show up, there are people who come in and out, then there are many scenarios where if you do colonoscopy a few times over a lifetime and you stick to that, that could be competitive with FIT. The key variable here is participation. 
So this is a long, it depends, but I think those are the realities of practice. Yeah, very good. So Yuri, I'm not sure all of our listeners will feel totally comfortable with what it means to be screened in a programmatic fashion versus opportunistic, just in, people, in case people haven't quite heard of that before. Could you explain that? Sure, sure. Sorry, sorry if that was a little jargony. What I mean by an organized program is basically that you have a group of people who say we're responsible for this population. So you have some list of who you're responsible in terms of their health care, and you try to make sure that they get screened. And when you took, talk about programmatic testing with FIT, that usually means frequent outreach yearly, often a mailed test to people's home, uh, attempts to make sure that people are returning the test. If it's positive, trying to get people in for their follow-up colonoscopy, because otherwise the whole effort is for nothing. So as you can see, people can fall off along the way. And the, the, the way to try to make this work is to stay on top of it. That's contrasted with what one might call an opportunistic type screening, which is basically, did you as a patient ask for it? Did your doctor remember? Is your doctor gonna remember next year? And in that type of scenario, as you can imagine, the, the adherence over time is probably not as good. And studies that have actually looked at this show that there was, there was a very nice study from John and Adomi in San Francisco in a safety net setting where they achieved certain levels of participation within the initial years of the context of the study. Then the support for the outreach went away and Peter Liang and others published on the follow-up years and, and that the uptake is not as good. So, so you need the support to get this done. In contrast, you could say the same thing about colonoscopy. Are people going to show up? But the opportunistic colonoscopy only needs to happen a few times in a lifetime. So I think the burden of keeping on top of it is different. And that's one potential difference between those two types of strategies. Long interval one versus one where you have short intervals and you really need repeated testing to stay up to date with screening. Yeah, sounds good. So um, for somebody who is, you know, maybe uh, 45 or in their 40s, all of a sudden they're, they're in the screening age group and they um, would like to, perhaps they're in the usual setting in the United States, which is this opportunistic setting where you're going to maybe talk to your doctor about it, who's going to refer you to a gastroenterologist or if you need a colonoscopy or is going to get the, the fit done. Any advice for, for what things they should be thinking about how, about how to get a good colonoscopy? Because we hear that they're not all the same. They're not all equal. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great question, Doug. And uh, of course, you're a pioneer in this area, so it's not going to surprise you that, that, that what I say has to do with colonoscopy quality and many, many principles that you, you have championed. Um, I think we go back to the adenoma detection rate. It's the best single metric we have for subsequent risk of getting cancer or even dying from cancer. So th that gets at how well are we doing at colonoscopy and can we measure it? And I do think culturally we've moved to the point where patients should feel comfortable asking whether doctors measure that adenoma detection rate and what it is and also other quality metrics. Do does the practice have a quality assurance program? Are they achieving good preparation rates, good uh, sequel intubation rates so you don't need to repeat procedures because they're failed or be referred elsewhere. And, and then what are, what are the doctors at noma detection rates? Because that really does make a difference. It may be a little bit of an awkward conversation, but we're getting those questions. You may be getting those questions. And I think others listening uh, should, should, should be ready to counsel their patients appropriately. You know, I think if we think about our relatives, if they're gonna have a colonoscopy, we want them to go to a so-called high detector. So I think we should say the same for patients. Absolutely. So if I could summarize, this has been a huge amount of useful information. I think you've told us that we have every expectation that colorectal cancer screening is going to work in 45 to 49-year-olds, probably the same as it does in everyone else, that it's a cost-effective uh, medical uh, practice, that there are several ways to do it. Perhaps we could say the most important thing is to, is to go and get screened, you know, talk to your doctor about what, what is available out there. If you choose colonoscopy, it's, it's got some advantages in terms of the length of protection, but try to ask a few questions about how to get a really good quality one because it, it, can, be, it can be variable. So I think these are all really great messages for both our primary care colleagues and for uh, patients who may be listening. And Yuri, I wanna thank you for your tremendous expertise and work in furthering our understanding uh, in this area. It's been a, been a, it's been a huge contribution. And uh, thanks to all of you for, for listening to us and good luck with 
getting patients screened for colorectal cancer. Thanks again, Yuri. Well, Doug, thanks for the invitation. It's an honor to discuss this with you. I mean, you're unquestionably one of the people who lead this field and, and uh, I hope that together we can make a difference for, for all our patients. So thanks a lot. Agreed, thank you. Thanks.